BCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. And welcome to Crosstalk on VCY America. Jim Schneider with you today. So glad that you joined us. We trust you're going to find today's program to be one that's going to uh, stir your mind to uh, certainly be thinking about things of God's Word. We're going to be taking a look at a number of biblical-related issues and topics here today and, uh, of course, give you opportunity to call in later with your questions and comments as well. It's our privilege to have with us today uh, Dr. John Whitcomb. He's been a professor of Old Testament and theology for nearly 60 years, widely recognized as a leading biblical scholar. He taught at Grace Theological Seminary in Winona Lake, Indiana from 1951 to 1990, uh, taught in many other uh, uh, educational settings as well. Uh, has held workshops and meetings all across the country, and uh, he has co-authored with Dr. Henry Morris uh, a book that was authored in 1961, The Genesis Flood, which is going to be having its 50th anniversary this coming February. Uh, he has uh, also has, has published The Early Earth, The World That Perished, and commentaries on Esther and Daniel. Uh, he has also authored six comprehensive and widely circulated Bible charts, numerous multimedia slides, and more than 100 biblical and theological articles. A uh, major emphasis in his teachings have been biblical creationism, dispensational theology, uh, the uh, premillennial eschatology, and presuppositional apologetics. And Dr. Whitcomb, it's our privilege to have you back with us here at Crosstalk. Thank you, Jim. It's a joy to be here and to open God's Word and listen to him speak to us on mm-hmm. issues that concern all of us today. Uh, Dr. Whitcomb, your book, uh, The Genesis Flood, soon to have its 50th anniversary. Uh, uh, at its time of writing, there were not books on the market uh, on the topic of creationism. This really was the catalyst that really got many, many people uh, thinking on this topic of origins and and uh, taking that, that literal approach to the book of Genesis. Well, Jim, it's amazing as we look back over these 50 years, because just two years before the book was published, namely 1959, the evolutionists of the world met in Chicago in a great convention to celebrate Darwin's 100th anniversary of his book, The Origin of Species, Mm -hmm. and to make a public announcement to the effect, creationism is dead. Mm -hmm. Slightly premature statement. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, Dr. Whitcomb, I've, I've got a host of, of questions that it will take us perhaps through the gamut of uh, what we find in Genesis as well as what we find in Revelation. And yeah. there's really a correlation between these right. two books. Right. Um, but one of the questions that I have been asked, and perhaps if you could respond to, uh, is this account going back to, to origins in the book of, of Genesis? And uh, the, the question has been asked, can a, a person be truly born again who will deny the Genesis account of creationism and accept by faith evolution. That is a very complex issue, Jim, because many Christians are misinformed, in fact, heretical, we might say. In fact, my definition, Jim, of a a heretic is not a person who is unsaved, but a Christian who is deeply compromised in major doctrines of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Of course, we all need con- confrontation, we need teaching, we need instruction day by day as to what God really meant by what he said in the only book he ever wrote. So it is theoretically possible to hold deviant views on origins and still be a Christian. But you see, the issue is not how heretical can you be and still be a Christian. Uh, that's a very dangerous approach to, to biblical and theological reality. It's how close can we come to what God really meant by what he said in these 66 books of the Bible, and to come to full, consistent truth on origins and the ultimate destiny of the universe. Dr. Whitcomb is with us here today, and need to mention, Dr. Whitcomb has not always been a born-again Christian. You were atheistic. You had that evolutionary mindset, and uh, by God's saving grace, uh, certainly as you studied and as you went to find out whether the claims of Scripture were true or not, to disprove Scripture, you found out that, yes, indeed, we do serve a Creator God. Right. Now, mm-hmm. that was an overwhelming, of course, permanent transformation in my life, Jim. Uh, when I, I didn't come from a Christian home. I was an only child in mm-hmm. a home that, it was a good home, a good family. But nevertheless, I never heard anything about God or Christ or sin or salvation or the Bible ever in my home. Uh, finally, in God's mysterious providence, I was sent 
by my parents to Princeton University to study public and international affairs and hopefully someday maybe to be a diplomat or even an ambassador for the U.S. State Department. When I arrived one week later, a student who had been to the same prep school I had been to came to my dorm room and invited me to come to a Bible class. I was totally uninterested. I didn't go to Princeton University to study a book that I thought was 2,000 years out of date. But you know what that student did? That sophomore, he prayed for me. And you know what seven things can happen? The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. He persisted. Several times he invited me. And finally, as it were to get him off my back, Jim, I came. And I heard a Bible teacher the like of which I'd never heard before. He opened the Bible graciously, effectively, carefully. And after several months under his teaching on Sunday afternoons in Murray Dodge Hall, the student center at Princeton University, he thought I was open to a personal confrontation in my dorm room one night. February 43, it happened. Mm. He explained who Jesus is. He didn't take time to ridicule evolutionism or my views on this and that. He said, let's talk about who Jesus Christ really is. And that night, as I found out that he died for my sins and rose from the dead, triumphantly, victoriously over death, I believed in him as my Savior. Amen. And all things passed away. All things became new, and I've never recovered. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Dr. Whitcomb, I've, I've got a couple of uh, lengthy questions here uh, yeah. for you. To, and here's the first one. Uh, uh, the book of Genesis, we know, is not only a historic book, but it also is a book of Bible prophecy as well. Yes. Uh, for instance, we have the, the creation account, the historical event, but we also have that prophecy in Genesis 3.15, that promise of that Messiah, right. uh, the one that was going to crush Satan's head. Um, at the same time, we're living in some very troubling times right now here in, in the year 2010. Uh, I think I could, I often have called these perilous times to capture the phrase that the Apostle Paul wrote in his second uh, epistle to Timothy. And uh, we've seen a lot of devastation in the world, uh, which many call natural disasters. We are uh, seeing economic collapse, economic chaos. We see those who are calling for a one-world unified monetary system. Uh, we've seen a government take control over the citizens and uh, having a socialistic mindset. Uh, we've seen the push for global governance, uh, and we're seeing what I call a meltdown in the church where uh, doctrine to many doesn't matter anymore, where doctrine takes second place to unity in the church, and uh, seeing a push toward a, a unified, not only a global political system, but a push toward a unified religious system as well. Uh, we're seeing a push toward the acceptance and promotion of, of homosexuality and transsexuality, uh, whether it be same-sex marriage or open homosexuality in the military, in our schools, uh, forcing acceptance in the workplace. I could go on and on, but it seems every day we open up the newspapers, we look at those stories, or we go online on the Internet and look at those news websites, and I remark, I can't believe it. I, I can't b believe what's going on. What next? I, I didn't think things would go this far. I didn't think th things would become this bad. And, and often we hear the remark that uh, the time of the Lord's return is nigh at hand. Uh, we also see scripture that says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So mm -hmm. if you could, all of that to say this, how bad was it during the times of Noah Yes. How bad was it during that time, and are we fast approaching that time? Uh, it, it seems when, uh, it, like, the Lord's return needs to happen soon, but yet we see that evidently things might not be quite where they were during the time of Noah. Yes. Before the Genesis flood, we read in Genesis chapter 6, the world was totally demonized, and I say that carefully. The sons of God, it says, B'nai Elohim, entered the human race, to bring perversion everywhere. Now, Jude and Second Peter in the New Testament look back and explain what happened. It says, angels that kept not their first estate who stayed where they belonged, but went after strange flesh, were condemned to pits and chains of darkness till the day of judgment. What does that mean? It means somehow Satan, who was the god of this world, at Adam and Eve's choice. I mean, they turned over their kingship to Satan. Genesis chapter 3, as we look back in that, we're shocked, horrified at what happened. But he is still the God of this world. But just before the flood, he reached his uh, ultimate power system by bringing perversion into the human race we can't even imagine. It got so bad that Genesis 6-5 says, 
God saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth, and that every thought of the imagination of his heart was only evil continually. Now, a human being can't be that bad, Jim, in my opinion, without demonic help. Hmm. It was a demonized world system by then, by the time of the flood. Now, of course, uh, many of those demons, as Peter, Second Peter and Jude tell us, were cast out of the world system. They, Satan lost a significant portion of his ar- demonic army at that, at that time of the flood. But he still is the god of this world and has millions of his demonic helpers. Now, of course, we realize, too, that Jesus defeated him judicially and finally and forever at the cross. He said, now is the prince of this world cast out. Now, that's when Satan's head was crushed. Genesis 3.15, as you quoted. Prophecy fulfilled. Right. Mm -hmm. Judicial defeat of Satan. But amazingly, this is hard for us to grasp, God extended his functions a little longer to accomplish some things in the church in the world, and even in Israel, that will not be fulfilled until the day of Armageddon at the end of this age, before the kingdom comes. Now, we see these things happening today in preparation for his final push to take over the world again through his masterpiece, the Antichrist, who is described as the beast. Now, he will be the worst human that will ever have walked the earth. He will oppose Israel He'll try to destroy that nation and everything it stands for. He'll force the whole human race to worship him, to take his mark on forehand and right hand. And he will destroy millions and millions of people at the end of this age. Now, as we see this happening, and I was a soldier in the Second World War in Germany. I saw the, I saw the remains of I mean, Holocaust victims. Uh, six million Jews in Germany killed, murdered. I couldn't believe, Jim, the things that God allowed Satan to do through that man, Hitler. But even worse things happen, as you know, through Stalin, through Mao Zedong. I mean, look at the monsters of destruction and horrible iniquity that have dominated this past century. In fact, more Christians, I've been told, have died for their faith in the last hundred years than all previous centuries combined. Mm. The Bible says, when you see, Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. In other words, these things are not, we don't rejoice because things are getting worse, because that means that the king is coming. We are horrified to see, we're to pray for people, we're to reflect the light of Jesus into people's lives as the darkness deepens. But the time, you're right, seems to be coming closer and closer, in which the church will be gone, darkness will cover the world, the Antichrist will appear. Dr. John Whitcomb with us here today on Crosstalk. We have a break coming up in just a few seconds, but uh, let me just mention for those of you in southeast Wisconsin, uh, Dr. Whitcomb is going to be speaking this evening for the Creation Science Society of Milwaukee. Uh, They are utilizing the facilities at Brookside Baptist Church at 4470 North Pilgrim Road in Brookfield. And uh, that meeting tonight underway from 7.30 till 9 p.m. And uh, we understand the mission is free for that. Well, there are those who are predicting an exact date for the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll find out what Dr. Whitcomb has to think about that in just a moment. You're listening to Crosstalk here on VCY America. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris, scientist with the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, what were the flying dinosaurs? Chris, the flying reptiles like the pterodactyls were not really dinosaurs. By definition, dinosaurs walked on land with bones different from the flying reptiles. But they're often in the same discussion, usually as being huge reptiles from the great age of reptiles. Of course, I disagree with the term age of reptiles. I think all animals were created during creation week flying animals on day five and land animals on day six. But, you know, there's a lot of evidence that these flying reptiles lived at the same time as humans. Sober historians of yesteryear describe such beasts and even drew pictures of them. And the American Indians even drew pictures of the Thunderbird, and their drawings are similar to the Pteranodon. Make no mistake, Chris, the evidence fits the back-to-Genesis truth of recent creation of all things. Thanks, Dr. Morris. For more on creation, visit our website at www.icr.org. 